Welcome to part two of acid-base titrations and pH, chapter 15. This is the second part and last part of the presentation on this chapter. And at this point, I believe for chemistry two, sadly, uh, which we could go farther. I don't think we have the time to be honest. In any case, let's move on from here. So this is simply a review of section one. Remember in section one, we talked about self-ionization of water and the fact that we can draw a constant out of that as a product of the two concentrations of hydronium and hydroxide, and that becomes the Kw value. We then talked a little bit about pH and of neutral solutions. We talked about the use of pH and we talked about the math behind pH and hydronium and hydroxide ion concentrations and how they are all related together. Matter of fact, this is a graphic organizer, if you will, of how they are related, where the top line shows you hydronium and hydroxide uh, as a product producing Kw, and below how pH and pOH actually combine to equal exactly 14. And if you know the hydronium ion concentration, how you can find the pH or vice versa. Same thing with hydroxide. And even while I, other than testing the math to make sure it worked, uh, you rarely ever have to do Kw to 14 or back, but it works. So that's a review of that section. Now let's move on to section two. Section two is determining pH and titrations. And what do we want to do here? We wanted to describe how an acid base indicator will function. We want to explain how to carry out an acid base titration, which is a really neat lab. And it's one that I, I wish we could have uh, run together. Uh, because normally if we have the time we do two labs one it's a lot more manual and old school where we're you know regular equipment and we're counting things and and measuring and the other one is using a computer interface to actually capture a lot of our data which is not too much less manual than the old school way but you do collect your data through electronics uh, on the computer and graph it and all of that unfortunately though you'll have to live with titrations in your uh, imagination or even better, look up a YouTube video uh, or two and see a titration actually in action. And then we want to understand how to use information from an experiment to actually calculate the molarity of a solution based on data from a titration, which is just the careful addition of one chemical to another that will react together and understanding the volumes and the, the, the amounts, the volumes and the concentrations of the substances reacting, which will allow you to prove what you know or determine unknowns that you didn't know to begin with. Okay, let's talk about indicators. So indicators are compounds, typically organic dyes, although they don't all have to be, which are sensitive to pH and will react to changes in pH by changes in color. So indicators can either be weak acids or weak bases, as in the example of uh, the generic H-I-N, meaning some sort of indicator that is a weak acid. And the hydrogen ion can weakly ionize away from the indicator anion substance. And it would be a reversible and you wouldn't have very much H plus or I-N uh, in your solution. But with that in solution, it can react to changes in acidic or basic substances. Uh, or changes in the solution rather to that. And it can just uh, reflect that with a color change that would be very visual uh, to us. So in this particular example, uh, the indicator is acting as a Bronsted base and will be able to accept protons from any acid, which would create then a color change as the indicator is able to accept and then go backwards. Specific indi indicators can operate over a range of pHs, and this is simply called the indicator's transition interval because uh, indicators do a variety of different things, but each one has its own unique function, I guess, if we want to adapt it to chemistry. Now, we can also use pH meters, which are electronic, or pH probes, which may hook up to a computer, and they can determine the pH by measuring a voltage difference using electrodes. So it's a little bit of a different measurement. And there would be no color change using those, of course, but you should be able to see some display that would read pH, or if pH is changing, you'd be able to watch the change happen as, you know, in real time, or on a computer, it may even graph for you. So here is one, two, three, four, seven. Looks like seven different indicators by the names of brome thymol blue, litmus, methyl orange, methyl red, phenolphthalein. That's a fun word to say, phenolphthalein. It's an even funner word if that's a 
if that's a way to say it. It's an even funner word to spell, phenolphthalein. Then there's phenol red and thymol blue. And the colors they have are kind of a yellow color to blue color in some cases, a red to blue, uh, a white to pink. And then uh, thymol blue actually has a double transition interval where way down towards the uh, zero end of the uh, pH scale, it has more of a red color, I think. And then when you get up into the basic level of nine on through, then you get a blue color. And in between, you have kind of a neutral color indicating that you're in that range. So the transition interval is just simply what you see. Uh, these indicators, you know, uh, will uh, have different functions based on when they actually uh, have their color change. And then, of course, we have that double interval there. Here is just a different slide showing uh, some of the same and some different ones as well oriented. You can pause and take a look if you'd like. Here is what is typically called a universal indicator. And what they have done is they have taken a number of those other indicators that you saw and some probably you didn't see and mixed them together to create kind of a universal indicator for lack of a, a better name. That's a great name. And it will change colors over a wide range of pHs. And if you do it right, if you have the correct mixture, then you can get it almost numerically on a whole number where it'll change, as you see here, kind of almost in the rainbow of indicators. And so a universal indicator is very good for being able to kind of focus in on a particular pH as opposed to saying, well, it's either acidic or basic or it's right about transitioning and then you can pinpoint exactly one, one or two uh, pH points. Okay, titrations. Because acids and bases react together, the addition of an acid or a base to its opposite could be used for comparing concentrations. Using this, we can determine the unknown concentration of one of our substances by the use of stoichiometry. And so it's back. <laughs> uh, controlled addition and measurement of the amount of a solution of a known concentration, which is required to react completely with a measured amount of an unknown solution concentration, will allow us to then use those volumes, use what we do know, plug it through stoichiometry and a couple of solution calculations, and be able to determine the unknown value that we are missing out on. Now, when both solutions are uh, present in chemically equivalent amounts, we call that the equivalence point, and the end point is where the indicator present in your substance, if you're using an indicator, will change color. And it's nice that if the equivalence point and the end point can be close to the same. Now I would, this is not a, because this is a recorded video now, uh, unlike a narrated presentation, which in a narrated presentation, you can probably click on that link. Otherwise, I would strongly suggest you, ch you check out this two and a half minute video from Professor Dave. He quickly uh, explains titrations. And I like the video uh, and it goes very, very quickly. I would simply search Professor Dave acid-based titrations and uh, you should get that exact uh, two and a half minute uh, video. Okay, titrations. So imagine, this is kind of setting one up, this is a thought experiment. Imagine starting with a small volume of a strong acid, approximately 50 milliliters of a 0.6 molar hydrochloric acid, so not much. And we slowly add a strong base of unknown concentration. At first, the pH is gonna rise slightly, then the acid will do a little bit of buffering. That means the acid has the ability to resist a dramatic pH change for a short time as uh, some of the rearrangement, uh, the atoms rearrange. Um, so the pH during that buffering moment, uh, buffering time won't change very much at all. But at some point, as you add more and more base, the buffering ability, the ability of the acid to resist a change in pH, you'll overcome that. You'll just overwhelm the acid, you'll overcome that. And all of a sudden, the pH will change very dramatically from low numbers to high numbers. And if you're measuring it with a pH meter, you can actually see the numbers. You'll see them start to change very dramatically with a drop or two, literally, of, uh, of acids or of, of the base or whatever you're adding. So this is the point of neutralization between the acid and the base. This is also the equivalence point where we see that dramatic pH change. This is also where an acid and base are in equimolar amounts. When the indicator changes color, we know that we've reached the end point. And then of course, if we continue to add base, that the uh, pH will continue to change upwards towards basic numbers, except it will start to taper off as the base builds up and up and up. 
and you'll reach reach pretty much the pH of the base itself, which will not maybe quite flatline or maybe flatline at that point when you've completely neutralized all of the acid and it's just base. So if we were to measure this with a pH meter and be able to uh, plot that against volume of one added to the other, this is my this might be what we see. And uh, with computer programs, we can actually do this. And this is one of the labs that I wanted to do with you. Uh, so imagine here. So let's check this out. So we start here with a pH of two, roughly, and that means we are starting with a relatively strong acid. So we start to add base and we see a pH change. So immediately the pH changes and it uh, gets almost a four, but then notice it flatlines for a little bit. This is the buffering area where it's really resisting the change in pH. But at some point you overwhelm that right about in here. And then all of a sudden, because we're continuing, continuing to add base, then the pH changes very, very dramatically. Uh, and here we reach the pH of seven, equivalence point all the way up through. And then eventually way up here is uh, all of the acid is reacted and it's all base at this point. And that's where you start to see it flatline because this would be the true pH of just the base by itself with no added chemicals. So this is what is called a titration curve. Uh, and it plots in this case, a strong acid with a strong base because we end very high towards 14 and we started very low towards two. So strong acid, strong base. You can do this strong base, strong acid, and it would just be the opposite. So you'd start high and end low, and that would be fine. You just have to know what you're adding together. So titration description. A strong acid with a strong base added, the pH will start very low and will end very high, as you saw. A strong base added with a strong acid, the pH would start very high and end very low. So you'd start here and then end somewhere down here. If you did a weak acid with a strong base, you would start at less than seven. So if that's seven, you could start it here. And with a strong base, you're still going to end high, but you're just starting high. And then the exact opposite. If you're starting, there's pH of seven. If you're starting with a weak base and a strong acid, then it would be something like that. So just all variations on titration curves. And here are a couple of questions down below. What do you think about a weak and a weak or a weak and a strong, you know, in that respect? Here are some examples of exactly what we talked about. You can pause and take a quick look at that and ex see exactly uh, what those curves look like. And the higher the, the closer you are to 14, the closer you are to zero, the stronger the acid or the base that you either started or ended with. Diprotic acids. So diprotic acids will have two equivalence points, one for each of the donated protons. A graph of the base added to a diprotic acid would look like a set of two stair steps going up and I right here. And so this would be a diprotic acid. This could be H2SO4. That would be a strong candidate for uh, starting with H2SO4 and adding, or maybe if, depending on where seven is on the scale, maybe it was a weak acid like carbonic acid instead. Um, so either way you get the stair step. There's the first proton donated. Here's the second proton being donated. Well, right in there, I should say. Did by the way, a triprotic acid, you get three stair steps. Okay, so this is showing a single, what's called a burette, this piece of glassware here. Oh, I think I'm gonna change colors. This piece of glassware here is a burette. It has a valve down below. When you open this valve, you can allow uh, the chemical to drip into your flask down in here. And you would have a known volume and it's uh, very, very highly accurate as far as all of the tick marks that you would have on this glass that you would be able to very uh, accurately determine the volume added from the burette down into the flask. So we may have, it uh, doesn't matter whether it's acid or base, but we have these substances and you're adding and you're adding and you're adding. And then eventually when you've added to a point, you get a color change. So what happens? Well, what's the difference between here and here if this is the same titration? This here is the volume added of whatever's in the burette. We knew the volume down here. We now know the new volume down here, and we know at least one concentration of the two substances. Given all of this information, a volume, a volume, and a concentration, we can then use stoichiometry and solve for whatever the unknown is.
So you can have to do your prediction. So I think the, we set the question up earlier about 50 milliliters of a 0.6 molar acid reacting with 70 milliliters of a lithium hydroxide, which is a strong base. But we don't know the concentration, see unknown concentration of the lithium hydroxide. At this point, when 50 of one is added to 70 of the other, the indicator we are using turns color. So that's the end point, the equivalence point. Uh, if we, you know, if, if they're the same at that moment. So what is the concentration of the lithium hydroxide? How do we find this out? Well, basically, here are the steps that you would want to do. First, you have to start with a balanced equation if we're going to predict this on paper. Then I need to use my known, really, this is known concentration of whatever your substance is, convert it to moles, and then you're going to go through stoichiometry to find moles of your unknown substance. Today, I know the acid. I don't know the base. And so that's why I'm starting with acid concentration. But whatever your known is here, that's what you're going to start with. And so you got to use your volume stuff, your, your, vol your volume information. Let's be precise. Your volume information to get to moles. Now, this was back when we were doing solutions, and I gave you a handwritten handout that had various uh, solution calculations. That This is one of them. Then once you get to moles, this is stoichiometry here to get from moles to uh, moles of your known to moles of your unknown, and that's using the balanced equation. That's why it's going to be the stoic. And then eventually, once you have the moles of your unknown, today it's the base, then you can go and you can figure out the unknown concentration. Okay, well, let's actually do this one. And for that, let me go ahead and erase this. And I'll actually work you through the calculations on how this will actually go. And it goes actually fairly quickly here. So the balanced equation, let me write up here so I have a little bit of extra room. I'm reacting hydrochloric acid with lithium hydroxide. It's a neutralization reaction, so we always make a salt. Today it's going to be lithium chloride plus one, negative one, it balances. And water, so H2O, or if you like it, HOH. And this self-balances, so I don't have to do anything with it. So it's a balanced equation. Okay, my acid concentration is that I have 0 0.050 liters times the concentration that I know, which is 0.6 zero moles of HCl per one liter. Liters and liters cancel. That gives me my answer in moles of acid. And I've actually calculated that out. And so the answer here at the moment is 0.03. I'm going to ignore sig figs for the moment. But 0 0.03 moles of HCl. So this is how many moles of hydrochloric acid were actually reacted in this in this titration. Now I want to use stoichiometry to get to the base. So this is just using your balanced equation of getting rid of moles of HCl and how many moles of my base did I react? Well the calculation up here tells me that for every one hydrochloric acid I need one mole of lithium hydroxide balance so there's a one-to-one -one ratio. Granted this math isn't hard but it's a 0.3 mole of lithium hydroxide that reacted as well with the hydrochloric. Okay, now moles of base we have, we want to go to molarity. Well, what's molarity? Molarity, remember, is moles over liters. So of the base, 0 0.03 moles lithium hydroxide that was involved in the reaction, and that was in 0 0.070 liters, because up there it was 70 milliliters, um, so, well, actually, I shouldn't cancel that out uh, because it's not canceling, it's uh, converting, or it's not converting, it's, it's molarity. So you do that math there, and it turns out that our unknown concentration was 0.43 molar lithium hydroxide. So this here was our unknown. And that's how you do this on paper. But in order to do this on paper and make your prediction, we have to do the titration. And that's up here. That's adding the 50 milliliters of a known acid with 70 milliliters of an unknown base, now unknown meaning concentration, and doing a careful addition so when you have these values reacted together, we see the color change on the indicator, and that's when we know to stop and why these values become fixed, 50 to 70. Uh, and that allows us then to do the balanced equation, which you can do the beforehand because you know the substances, you just don't know a concentration. Then this is the solution right in here 
then the stoichiometry right in here, and then it goes back to the solution again. So solution, stoichiometry, solution. Pretty much they all run the same way unless uh, an unusual question is asked. This is simply a typed version, which is certainly much cleaner than uh, my uh, handwriting back there. You can pause if you really want to look this over. Uh, I'm going to move on. So titrations and indicators. Choosing a narrow range indicator will help to accurately determine pH at the endpoint, although you can use a pH meter or a pH probe hooked to a computer that can show that voltage change and maybe even like uh, our pH meters in the program of Lugger Pro can actually show you the graph and you can see when it spikes. You can see that vertical line and you go, ah, ah, we are there. So then you stop. Uh, and plus your data is recorded, so you can go back and analyze it at any point. Uh, generally speaking, if you're going to have a pH greater than 7 or a great pH under 7, uh, you want to choose uh, the appropriate indicator like methyl orange or phenolphthalein is a very good, uh, very commonly used uh, indicator. Around a pH of 8 or 9, it actually changes pink, so it's very, very visual. Solutions, or excuse me, titrations and molarity. So a solution that has a very precisely known concentration of solute, we call the standard. Uh, that would be our known value. So that in the acid reaction a moment ago, that would be the acid. We knew that one. Now, if we want to compare and make sure that we know that what our acid is, because we're, we're trusting that our acid was 0.6 molar, we could actually do a titration on that acid. We know the acid, but do we really know the acid? So then we would con uh, compare it to a primary standard. Now, this is kind of like gold level primary standard chemicals. This is something that you probably would not prepare in your lab at school, uh, even in college. This is one you're going to actually have an industry prepare for you that is set up to actually prepare these types of uh, very purified, very high quality chemicals. So you compare your what you think you have to the primary standard and yep, I came up with 0.6. So if it's a 0.6 molar, I can now trust it when I do a titration with it, relying on it to help me as my known value. So when you run into these terms, that's what they're talking about. Now, this is also a video that I looked up. This one runs just under 10 minutes. It's the Khan Academy. It's called Titration Introduction. Very excellent video. I highly suggest not only the Professor Dave, just to kind of wet your feet in titration, but then also watch this one, and it'll run you again down through that uh, cal uh, the calculations uh, with a little bit of visual, so that, you know, that wonderful Khan Academy presentation. And they have, uh, as their next up video over here, I don't know if you can see it or not, but right here, their next up video is just an example of a titration. So by all means, you know, watch one and then watch the other. And again, it really kind of builds on how you're actually watching. If this is just a narrated presentation, you may be able to click on that link. Otherwise, just search Khan Academy and uh, titration introduction and you'll get it. Now, how is it done? So this is simply just a step-by-step, -step, and I'm not going to take a lot of time to go through this because this is really a lab process. But you can pause and you can take a look at these uh, steps if you want and see, you know, just kind of uh, imagine this goes right hand in hand with your book. Normally, we would be doing this in a lab. So, you know, you either have one burette, those, those tall glass, they really are like graduated cylinders with a valve on the bottom. They're that highly precise. You either start with one burette or two. Uh, if you have two burettes, you put an acid in one and the base in the other, and then you just label them. And so you can really just draw off of each burette when you need one or the other, as opposed to pouring out of a flask or, or a graduated cylinder or something like that. And so one or two burettes, you'll see both setups and they both have their uh, advantages. Uh, and it's really about uh, recording very precise volumes of what you put to what. And there you go. That, that's it. Choosing a right indicator, waiting for a color change, and that color change will occur within a drop or two. And then you get some very, very precise volumes to allow you to do the on paper part of the prediction. So this is just, again, continuing with steps, uh, mentioning in step six about the phenolphthalein. Um, Step 9 and 10, doing some subtraction and doing the volumes, and then uh, finally, and again, this is just 10 steps because of what your book produced. Uh, it just depends. But all titrations are essentially done the same. 
Okay, so this is the last example here, and I only have a couple of slides left. So uh, titration calculation example, one more. If you've got it, don't watch this. If you uh, want to see one more worked out, here we go. This is the last, and for chemistry too, this is the last of the last. So in this example, I have 22 and a half milliliters of a 0 0.005 molar. Now I'm gonna have the base, so I know the base this time. And that is the amount required to reach the end point which is the color change of uh, our indicator at this point, with only 10 milliliters of an unknown concentration of hydrochloric acid. The question is, what is the concentration of the acid based on this information? Well, uh, the, pro the, 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 the flow of the question, the, the problem solving strategy would be first, start with the balanced equation. Second, you need to know the moles of your known that you used in the titration that got reacted together. Then you want to convert using stoichiometry the moles of your known reacted to the moles of the unknown reacted. And that's going to be through the balanced equation and stoichiometry mole to mole. Then using the moles of your unknown, you then simply combine that with the unknown volume, meaning I, I know the volume, but it's of the unknown substance, of course. Uh, the moles of your unknown with the volume of your unknown that was used uh, at the by the equivalence point, and then that will allow you to go moles by liters, gives you the molarity. So they, pretty much they all they all do the same thing. You can turn this around and have to have to solve a little bit differently. Uh, so there are variations on this. It's not so it's not so formulaic that it's always absolutely this way. There is some variety on things you can know and things you can't know and how you can solve it. But these are generally the way titrations work on paper. Okay, so this allows me to interact with this particular problem. And so let's go ahead and interact and solve it together. And to be honest, if you don't want to see me solve this, if you don't want to hear me talk, uh, talk it through, you could actually forward to the next slide. The next slide is simply, I believe, the typed version of this answer. But I'm going to work through it. Okay, first thing I need to know is a balanced chemical equation. So that one would be my sodium hydroxide combining with my hydrochloric acid. It's a neutralization, or in this case, a double replacement reaction to form a chemical salt, which today is NaCl, positive one, negative one. So that's NaCl and water. And you can write water HOH or H2O. Now, this is a one to one ratio. So that's my stoichiometry eventually. But if this were reacting with sulfuric acid or phosphoric acid or something like that, I may have a different ratio. So that stoichiometry can change by you know a two to three or a one to three or a one to two or something. So this is not always a one to one ratio. This equation, however, is balanced. And so it, today it's a one to one. So the first thing I do is I want to uh, solve my known substance and get to the moles of it. So what did I do? The volume is 0 0.0225 liters, and I want to uh, multiply that by its uh, by its concentration, and that will allow me to know moles. So one liter, so liters and liters cancel, and that gives me moles, and that's 1.125 times 10 to the negative four molar, and that will be no, 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 that's not molar. I heard you in the background, Spence. That's not molar. That's right, it's moles of the NaOH reacted. Okay, so I needed to know that first. That's how many moles actually were involved in the reaction. Now I do the stoic. And the stoichiometry is to take that number, 2, 5, that's a 1. And that was ugly. So let's go ahead and do this. 1.125 times 10 to the negative four moles of my NaOH. Run it through stoichiometry. Well, in the balanced equation for every one mole of base, we have one mole reacting of acid. And that will give me the same number, of course, of the HCl reacted. And then I can do the volume concentration of my unknown. So I have a mole amount of 1.125 times 10 to the negative four moles of the HCl. I used, reacted 0.010 liters of the acid. You do this math, 
and the answer comes out to be 0 0.011 molar to correct sig figs now I think I've got uh, 0 0.011 molar of my HCl and that is what my unknown was and what it was requesting so that's on paper a stoichiometry but remember on paper simply means that we did an experiment and we found this we found this and we were just either confirming if we knew this and we want to confirm do we really know that that's a 0 0.011 molar or we don't know it at all and we discovered oh it's a 0 0.011 molar it works either way either way i believe the last slide is simply a typed version and that's all this is certainly much cleaner much more elegant if you will uh still arriving at the same answer so there you go that's uh titrations i strongly recommend you watch a couple of videos uh there's a little bit of uh probably ungraded uh and graded homework in the google classroom and that's that wraps it up uh we can't go farther we don't have any time to take it to uh, equilibrium chapter 18 or redox chapter 19. Uh, i feel bad about that but this is where we're at and you're all seniors so we're gonna we're gonna call it this thank you very much and uh, that's the end of the presentations obviously contact me if you have any questions and watch videos uh, the videos will probably do a, a wonder for uh, your understanding because it'll add more visuals than i can put in thank you